What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and we're going to check out the latest Wizards of the Coast video on their D&D official YouTube channel, Vecna Eve of Ruin, everything you need to know. We've seen these videos before, they've done it for things like when Humblewood launched, I think they did it for the Dungeon Dudes thing, they did it for Big Bees. So let's go ahead and see what is truly everything we need to know about Vecna Eve of Ruin. Here we go. Maybe. Uh, who knows? I guess we'll find out when it loads. So we have a very exciting book that's coming out. Multiversal threat to yeah. all of D&D, to several different campaign settings and, and realms. This is a face-off with Vecna. What is the name of this book? Uh, this <laughs> book is called Vecna, Eve of Ruin. What was the inspiration for this book? The biggest inspiration for this book, I think, was Die, for a D and d adventure that would really strike players and fans with a bang. And Does he kind of give you Freddy Krueger vibes? I'm getting very Freddy Krueger from this art, right? With the kind of skin kind of stretched and the uh, kind of skin underneath. He's giving me Freddy Krueger, for sure. What better way to get players and DMs excited about D&D than to bring Vecna back with a vengeance uh, for a 20th level adventure? And this starts off at 10th level. It does, yes, yes. So the, the players, the adventurers are already established heroes in the city of Neverwinter or somewhere else throughout the world and happen to be in Neverwinter when these events kick off. They become on a crash course for a confrontation with Vecna, uh, who in the background is already up to things that are going to cause the main plot. But it wasn't an accident, Todd, that this is the adventure that we settled on for this year, uh, the celebration of 50th anniversary. It does a lot of things that we'll be seeing echoed throughout the whole year, sort of a celebration of D&D writ large. It's classic villains, it's classic settings and locations. Morning, Some Kana. very famous uh, characters, face characters of D&D will be making appearances in this adventure. So the adventure was really a deliberate aim on our part to kind of reinforce that idea that D&D has this legacy and this this range to it and all of these settings and all I know this guy from something with the snakes I can't picture who that is all of these characters how can we weave a story that takes a bunch of those and sort of scoops them all up blends them together in an interesting way and Vecna is a is one of our kind of supreme baddies and We've we've certainly featured this character before in other stories and other adventures in the history of D and D, but it seemed like a good time, um, particularly since uh, Vecna. I mean, he goes all the way back to the very beginning of the game. How much can you tell me about this threat? Because I've read the adventure. <laughs> It's terrifying. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah, there is a lot going on. It's not that Vecna wants to subjugate any one world in the multiverse. Vecna wants to become the supreme being of the multiverse. He wants to make all of the multiverse in his own image, um, bend it to his own will. So every single world that is out there, Vecna wants to become the most powerful supreme being, the, the only god and the supreme god, and have everything and everyone bow to him. That, that's what he's trying to do. So that means if you already have an existing campaign and, and you, you've come to this 10th level moment, like it doesn't matter what world you're on, if you do not get yourself involved, this could be the end of your reality. It's true, yeah, absolutely. Your reality and every other reality. It's not the end, and I think that's kind of what makes this yeah. this, this book scary. It's not the end of existence. It's not just nothingness if the characters fail. It's actually a remaking of the multiverse in the most horrifying way possible to meet what Vecna would think of his ideal reality. You get glimpses of this, uh, of these possibilities throughout the adventure, especially toward the end of the adventure as um, Vecna is trying to come close to completing his ritual to remake the multiverse. But you, you see kings uh, having been turned undead and swearing their undying fealty to Vecna and subjugating all of their subjects and making them over. Okay, can we talk about the art? The art looks fantastic for what it is. Also, interesting that it is true. It's not like um, it's not like uh, they're gonna destroy the universe or uh, like a Thanos just delete fifty percent of um the the world to. I mean, obviously, if you go with the original, it's just because he wants to impress Lady Death. Or if you go with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
It's to bring balance to the world, you know, to the universe, the multiverse, by snapping half of reality out of existence. Um, but it's interesting that he's not doing that. He's not trying to destroy the world. He's just trying to reshape it and that he is the only one in charge. Um, so, yeah. Obey Vecna's commands. You see gods being murdered in some cases and killed and thrust into the astral plane, you know, on Vecna's whim because he thinks it's funny, right? He thinks it's funny not only to be the god of everything, but to, uh, but to destroy anything that would rise up against him. How do you convey the, the stakes in this adventure? Like, as you mentioned, these hints of like, there are <clears> kings <throat> who are like converting over to, to Vecna's side and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'd say communicating the stakes are very subtle hints throughout the adventure, um, especially early on, that things are not quite right, that there's magic that's- The art is just so good thrumming throughout the the multiverse that's being picked up on by very powerful wizards knowing so that's clearly morden canaan at the top i think that's supposed to be tasha on the bottom left right or or some iteration of her and is that like laurel silverhand i think maybe on the right that's my guess that something isn't right and that is part of the thrust of the plot of this book that there are oh uh, yeah you can see the hat on the chair so it's definitely tasha very powerful wizards some of the most powerful wizards in existence who have deemed that there's something wrong and have activated their network of of helpers and allies to figure out what is exactly is going on and what they find out is that cults of vecna have been working throughout the multiverse to extract really powerful secrets from um, in some cases very powerful individuals to weave those together and to transfer well, that makes sense. They're talking about pulling secrets. It makes sense to have a ton of Nothics. Um, Nothics have that kind of ability to extract secrets. And we have some sort of Vecna cultist here. You can see the symbol of Vecna on the background, and somebody's clearly trapped in a cage. Transfer that power to Vecna, who's putting it all together to try to create this chaos bomb that when A Sarek? Could it... Oh... Interesting. Exploded will remake that universe in his image. However, secrets have a lot of power in this book, right? Vecna being the god of secrets, having the ability to use his magic uh, to pull out the power from those secrets and create his ritual. Well, in that same way, the characters actually have access to the power of secrets themselves because they are inexplicably tied to Vecna. They talk to important NPCs throughout the adventure, several characters per chapter in most cases, and they get important secrets. They learn important secrets from these, these characters who become allies of the party and uh, divulge the secrets uh, on their own free will to the characters. I think we're going to get Strahd as an ally, I'm like pretty sure. Whether it's something they're worried about, whether it's something they know that could cause a lot of power, whether it's something they feel guilty about, these are all the power of these secrets. And the characters, once they learn the secrets, can use them to gain an edge over Vecna, can, can activate those secrets to get a little bit of power during combat. We actually have a mechanical subsystem for this <laughs> to make it even more fun for the players. Um, and so- Hold on. A mechanical subsystem for secrets? Hang on. Let's look. Or whether it's something they feel guilty about, these are all the power of these secrets. And the characters, once they learn the secrets, can use them to gain an edge over Vecna, can, can activate those secrets to get a little bit of power during combat. We actually have a mechanical subsystem for this <laughs> to make it even more fun for the players. That's really cool. That actually gives me very Baldur's Gate 3, Act 3 vibes. I won't spoil anything for people who haven't played it. But the concept of gathering allies, in this instance, gathering secrets that you can burn or use, maybe they're permanent things, maybe they're limited access things, to just mechanically improve some aspect of your character. Could be something as simple as plus one to attack rolls or the effects of bless. Could be advantage on wisdom saving throws. I'm hoping it's something like that, because that does sound pretty interesting. Um, and so the characters have access to, to that and they can understand how Vecna was able to gather enough power and twist that into that evil, uh, diabolical, undead uh, style, uh, very, very, very wicked power that he's making. In the so this is clearly Vecna, right? We see this kind of, this sort of golden armor, almost arcano mechanical in some aspects 
look is Vecna. We saw that traditional Lish with the headrest and the staff sitting on a throne. That looks to me like a Sererak. The Lich from, obviously he's a much larger Lich from more than just Tomb of Annihilation, but he's the Lich on the front cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, he's there, so I'm thinking, potentially, we could possibly have Strahd and a Sererak, possibly, as allies. Like, that would be very cool. Also, remember that in the Bigby's Glory of the Giants adventure, like, Bigby was reincarnated as, like, a gnome or a halfling. I think a gnome. So one of those characters that we saw that was captured that I think might have been a gnome might have actually been Bigby. The characters had the opportunity to combat that in their own way by using that magic for good. What elements were important for you to capture in this, being this that this is like the 50th anniversary, this is also 10 years of 5th edition? It is a momentous occasion, and it is a great celebration of the time that we're in. And it's a great celebration of 5th edition too, because over the course of 5th edition, we've released a number of adventures. And we thought, as part of the celebration, not just of the 50th, but of 50th... Uh, they did say, I mean, this also looks like a necromancer. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But remember, they mentioned at some point that you'll be hopping, you'll be doing like multiversal travel. We saw like uh, spell jammers in that. We saw Miska the wolf spider. So Planescape style stuff might be happening. I think the Rod of Seven Parts is going to make a point of presence in this book as well. So we'll see. Fifth edition, to go back to some of those <clears throat> settings that we have other campaigns in, going back to Ravenloft, which... There you go. Going back to Ravenloft. Of course, we, we've we been to with fifth edition with Curse of Strahd. Going back to the Nine Hells, which... Oh, is... never mind. He might have just been talking about that we went there already, but it sounds like he meant that we're going there again. Oop, I killed the volume. Oh, crap. And I scrolled back. Very classic. What I like about the adventure, very much feels like all hands on deck. It does, like, yes. This is, this is the... Sorry. ...participating in Vecna Eve of Rowan, Curse of Strahd, going back to the Nine Hells, which, of course, we did in Descent into Avernus. Going back to some of these Look locations that, art. that we've already been to. What's up with the spider mask on this... Pit Fiend? Baylor? Whatever? What is that? In 5th edition, just help to remind people where 5th edition has gone and it, the journey that it has been on. And so that was a fun opportunity to go back to some of these familiar places. This is like a Raven Queen, possibly, like Acolyte with all the Raven skulls and stuff? Because there will be some players have been in those campaigns. Yeah. And so they will instantly have some knowledge about those locations already in their heads from those experiences. And we thought that that would be kind of a fun, a fun sort of meta experience for the players who are participating in Vecna Eve of Ruin, that when they have to find one of the rod pieces and it's in this piece of Ravenloft that they've already experienced. Yeah. Strahd has one of the pieces of the rod of seven parts. You are gonna go back to Ravenloft. So potentially, it could be a contentious meeting with Strahd. It could be a peaceful meeting. I guess you'll have to play it out. They've got a familiarity with it and hopefully a fondness or a terror, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> depending, <laughs> depending on their experiences. And, and that's, that gives the adventure another level yeah. that it didn't have otherwise. It's a very daring um, adventure in that regard, but it all, it all, it's also very classic. What I like about the adventure very much feels like all hands on deck. It does, like, yeah. This is, this is the end or a horrible end, whether you're the players or your NPCs and all of Dean and Lore th throughout many, many years of the game, mm -hmm. it feels like everyone got the call. <laughs> it, it does, yeah, absolutely. So uh, how I was talking before about what Vecna is doing, um, making a lot of waves and creating a lot of magical feedback and gaining the attention of very powerful spellcasters who are paying attention to the weave and the way that uh, magic is reacting in the world. One of the most powerful spellcasters in uh, in the multiverse, but certainly well, in the Forgotten Realms, is a wizard named Illustrial Silverhand. Illustrial, and okay. She is so it's Illustrial Silverhand, not Laurel Silverhand, but either way, one of the Silverhands, which is who you see here.
Somebody who hasn't been in D&D a lot recently, has had stats, but not for this edition, not for fifth edition. And uh, she is a primary character in this book. She is one of these powerful wizards who has noticed and realized that something is wrong and uh, has dug into it because she is a champion of good. Um, she's the Lady of Silvery Moon. Uh, she's got a long history that goes all the way back to the novels from 20, 30 years ago and uh, is this just this powerful bastion of good in, in the universe. And when she is worried about something going wrong, you know that something is very much going wrong. But so I don't want to have it like take over, but like Drizzt should play a part in this, right? I mean, it's it's if this is a multiversal thing like this and you're Paul calling in like all the big guns, Drizzt and the Companions of the Hall should play a part in this somehow, right? If it's gonna take place in part in Dragonlance, you should pull in the crew from Dragonlance. You should be pulling in a lot of these major characters. Now, I realize some of them may not have things to do, right? Like, what's Drizzt gonna do ultimately against a super powerful wizard? Not much. But he could lead a ground force, right? Um, but, like, there should be presence of a lot of these major characters for sure. When she figures out that Vecna cultists are involved, that Vecna is involved, that Vecna is trying to do something that is more than just ascend to godhood, which he's already done, she kind of freaks out and she says, I can't, you know, he's a lich, he's a god in Greyhawk, I can't understand necessarily how to stop him on my own, or I can't figure it out on my own, so I need help. And she puts the call out to her allies. Um, Tasha, who is, of course, a very well-known uh, and has appeared more, more recently in D&D's yeah. history. Tasha uh, answers that call. A version of Tasha answers that call, not her fae queen version, because she's got, you know, time travel is a thing. There, there are versions of her. And Mordenkainen, who is also very well-known, who's appeared a couple of times in 5th edition, sort of in a cameo role, and, of course, you know, is a very important figure, both in lore but also in D&D history. Those are Lestriol's most powerful allies. They come to her sanctum in Sigil um, to try to, to come up with a plan because they realize not only does anybody, not anybody know exactly what's going on, but this is a multiversal issue and there's no way we can actually marshal all of the, the authorities uh, throughout the multiverse to try to stop him. We've got to do you th So, I mean, we shouldn't just, not these, just these three, right? Elminster, 100% should be involved. Bigby, every other named wizard that's basically ever existed. Tensor, um, you should bring in people like Robillard. Everybody that has ever been a named wizard that's had any kind of fame, Melf, all of these characters in one form or another, unless they're dead and they haven't found a way to bring them back through story of one way or another, they should be involved. Any of the high-level clerics that have ever exist in any form, you should be bringing in all of the really super crazy powerful monks, right? There's a lot of weird stuff going on with the drow now in the newer Driz novels, so, like, you could have Lalth involved because she's kind of good now. Like, there's a lot of people you could be bringing in. You should be pulling all those deep cuts, every favor you've ever had. And, like, yeah, I mean... Not that you necessarily want to, but also this would be an amazing way to pull the Baldur's Gate 3 characters into canonical D&D, right? Yeah, pull Gale into this. Shadowheart, Asterion, whoever. I mean, some of these, Lazel and Asterion in the grand scheme of things, probably not like super powerful, but like, you know, Shadowheart's a super powerful cleric. You know, Gale could, has a nuke in his chest. Right. There are a lot of people you could, this would be a great way to involve them in some format to canonize them in the world of D&D. That would be a cool thing to do, right? They reference things like going to Avernus and traveling back from that. They bring that up in Baldur's Gate 3. There's the new novel coming out next week, The Fallbacks. That would be a great way to involve that party, right? And then just start pulling from any novel that hasn't been referenced in a while, right? The Brimstone Angels, bring in Farida and all of her and her sister and, and everybody else. Bring those guys all in. There's a lot of really cool people you could bring in. Or characters that were mentioned in like one-off scenarios or were like more prominent in existing D&D books. Like all of the heads of the Lords of like Waterdeep and all the different people from like the Tyranny of Dragons series. 
you know, everybody that was kind of the heads of the various different alliances that met to fight against the cult of the dragon, right? So many, like, this is such a good opportunity to give everybody a piece of the pie and bring people in, canonize people that were not necessarily canon. The other silver hands, sure. Um, the Harples, all the Harple wizards, they do more harm than good sometimes, but bring in the entirety of every Harple uh, wizard, they'd be great. Misk and Boo would be fantastic. Jahira is now brought, you know, is officially still alive, we know from Baldur's Gate 3. Um, you know, there was all the characters in the novels where Minsk and Boo got brought back. They, like all those characters that were running around Waterdeep, they could be brought in to this in some form. I mean, what this honestly reminds me of, or what I think it should remind me of, is any later edition Power Rangers cartoon, or not cartoon, like Power Rangers show. Because once they've established that there are multiple ranger teams in multiple parts of the world, the fact that they don't rely on the other ranger teams makes no sense. And they start doing that. Like, the, in, they'll open a portal and bring a different ranger from another team in, right? This is just like what they did with Forever Red and the, you know, the Master Morpher with Tommy and all this stuff where they bring in a whole team of rangers from all different things, and they, they all show up to help out in some format. Like, that's what this should be. This should be a culmination in a variety of different ways. You could bring in the D&D cartoon characters. You could bring in uh, the group from Honor Among Thieves, the movie. Like, I mean, some of these have stat blocks, some don't. Like, this would be a great way to bring them all in. And it's because it's across the multiverse, right? It's everywhere. They should all be involved in one form or another. Yeah, are, you know, the Honor Among Thieves crew going to do a whole hell of a lot in this fight? Probably not. Might they just use this as an opportunity to make money for themselves? Probably. But they should still be referenced. They should get a little moment in the sun, even if it's just like a off, you know, like a hand, offhand comment. There's a lot of options to bring people in, and it should feel like that. Like, it'll be cool for people who don't know, but even cooler for people who do. Um, so... You know, like I said, it should be more than just these three, right? We should get everybody that's ever been involved in some format. Maybe they'll talk more about it. But yeah, I mean, you look at the villains, right? We talked about Strahd's going to be involved. I'm hoping a Serax involved in some way. You know, Zastam and the Red Wizards, like, yeah, they want to be do their thing, but they don't want Vecna to rule. They should, they're probably against Vecna. The Cult of the Dragon and all the Tiamat worshippers... Joe Manganello's character, um, you know, what's his name? Oh, the you know who I'm talking about, a name I can't remember. He should be involved in his crew. They put them in Descent into Avernus. He should be involved. Um, sure, pull in Large Luigi, the other weird characters from other aspects of the multiverse. You pull in a ton of people and really have a lot of cool aspects of bringing people in here. I mean, in theory depending on how multiversal it goes, and given the fact that Critical Role had Vecna as the villain of their first campaign, you could potentially pull Vox Machina in here if you really wanted to. I don't know. But this is an opportunity to do that. And any instance where somebody isn't like brought up or something like this, uh, you could absolutely bring in stuff and, and, and give it an opportunity to get it a moment in the sun and really do it well. Uh, and, and then give a lot of people like the fan service that they want. Do something. Um, and so the plan that they put together involves uh, their own powerful magic, casting a wish spell, trying to reverse some of the progress that Vecna has made so that they can end his plans. That never goes well. You go straight to wish as your first move? All right or at least pause it long enough for them to go and confront him. They don't know where he is. This is complicating it. Uh, and then for reasons the characters won't find out until much, 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 much later, um, their spellcasting doesn't work. Uh, when they cast that wish, Vecna's progress isn't reversed. There's no impact of what he's trying to do, but the characters show up. The characters are shunted from wherever they are. The art is beautiful. I just want to make sure I reiterate that again. Like, Illustrial Silverhand, she's a hottie. But yes, uh, where is all the other characters like Elminster, Chosen of Mistra, Goddess of Magic? He should be involved in some form, right? Like, come on. 
And the wizards don't know why, but they have to come up with a backup plan to try to stop Vecna because literally these people are their only hope. And once the once the wizards, the wizards three, that's what we're calling them, is another nod to D&D's history. Once the wizards three realize that these uh, these heroes, these tenth level heroes, are fated to confront Vecna, that they are the only ones who can actually stop Vecna because they they have a piece the blood um, war right uh, of here. Lich. They have a metaphysical tie to the Lich because of the confrontation that they had previously had with the cult of Vecna. These characters are the only ones who can actually do it. Um, and it's going to take a powerful artifact to try to stop Vecna's plan. Around seven parts. Um, which is already, of course, already in motion. And uh, then the characters set upon the quest to find the Rod of Seven Parts. The, the pieces are all throughout the multiverse, and the characters are the ones who have to go and get it. And so then there is an, an epic quest that the characters set off on, uh, on a clock to try to, to finish it before um, Vecna can make any significant process and, and make this plane come to fruition, they've got to go get this this very iconic artifact to D&D's history. So each piece is in seven different locations. Some of them are different campaign settings, and some of them are different planes of existence. Obviously, we've seen Strahd has one. Um, but you are in seven very distinct areas um, that have elements to them in that adventure area that are very distinct to the setting that they're yeah. in. There's so many elements to this adventure that I am actively excited about, and there there is something so wonderful about an adventure where, I mean, you as a player, you are effectively the embodiment of a wish. Yeah, yeah. I love the amount of fate and importance that puts on a player mm -hmm. from the get-go. Like, the wish spell didn't work, but it kind of maybe theoretically does because the only answer that came, in, came into existence or showed up for these players. That's true, right. And if you think about the way the wish spell works, um, it's a very taxing magical spell. Uh, you can literally uh, try to structure it in a way to make any effect that you want. And yeah. Somebody's gonna need to get Tasha some like Visine after this. Look how bugged out her eyes are. And look at the fucking smirk on Morden Kanan. Clearly illustrial and taught like I don't trust Morden Kanan, honestly, from this image alone. Illustrial and Tasha are like very clearly worried about what's happening, and Morden Kanan just has this fucking shit ain't grin on his face. I don't trust him. What the effect that Illustrial and Morden Kanan and Tasha want is to stop Vecna, but because they don't have all the details and they don't know what he's doing and they don't know where he is, the way that they've worded that question, which I imagine is probably something like, can we please stop Vecna from remaking the multiverse? Uh, mm -hmm. is for the characters to show up, right? And so when they say, can we have a solution to stop Vecna? And the only answer is these four or five heroes from Neverwinter show up, then that's a very interesting response to that from the, the magic that's inherent in the universe. So where is this? I see some shambling mounds, right? You see these here? This looks like a hammer, a sword, and maybe a staff? Like these are, could this be Ravenloft again? But like, it looks like some sort of maybe forge or temple. Very clearly shambling mounds, I'm not sure. Feels like a whole bunch of little mini adventures, all like every chapter mm -hmm. feels like, okay, this is a unique location in the D&D multiverse and a unique plane or campaign setting and you're going to get the flavor of each of them. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a great introduction to like D&D in general because uh, it, you know, you could always go to Sigil and see like all these different creatures interact, right? You know, yeah. in Planescape, but this is like you just universe hopping. Yeah, we've talked a lot internally about um, the way that this book is structured and how, like you said, each of the seven locations are seven distinct chapters with seven distinct places um, and settings where the pieces of the rod are. I'm really having a hard time discerning what a lot of these characters are. So obviously we know it's going to take place some part of it in Neverwinter. So there's your Forgotten Realms. We know we're going to Ravenloft. They mentioned Sigil a bunch, so we know we're going at least to the City of Doors at the very least. Maybe not it's too much time. I'm assuming we're going to go to Avernus, right, from the, all the Blood War art we saw. Uh, maybe, like, to some degree, space for Spelljammer. I'm not sure. Um, maybe Greyhawk, right? We know Vecna's a god of Greyhawk, so it might make sense to go there. But we haven't really gotten a campaign setting set in Greyhawk. So this might be an intro to that, possibly, of like a, a teaser. We could go to um, other aspects within the Forgotten Realms. Or we could go to Thay, we could go to Chult, um, bounce around. We could go to Kryn, right? We've done Dragonlance, we could do that. 
we could pop over to some Magic the Gathering universes. That seems like a no-no to me because this is supposed to be history of Dungeons and Dragons, not history of D&D Magic crossovers. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so we got Forgotten Realms, Sigil, Nine Hells, Ravenloft. Maybe something Spelljammer-y, maybe Dragonlance, and then maybe Greyhawk. That's seven. That could be the seven parts. Found that you could play each individual chapter <coughs> as a standalone, right? If you don't want to run this whole. That's a sweet dragon. Massive uh, campaign. If you uh, haven't got a group, you know that wants to play for for six months or a year throughout this entire story, uh, you could just get together for you know three or four probably sessions and go get one piece of the rod and and tell a story saying you know you're one of many groups that has to go retrieve the rod of seven yeah. parts to stop Vecna. And so in that way, hopefully it will be very versatile and very usable for DMs who really are super into Eberron and they really want to run an Eberron story. Eberron? Didn't even think about it. I'm guessing that was Eberron, right? Is that official drop? They can run the story of retrieving the part of the part. Eberron is one. Part of the Rod of Seven Parts that's located in Eberron or Ravenloft or Spelljammer. Um... Spelljammer. Eberron, Ravenloft, Spelljammer. We got three right there. Or the Forgotten Realms. You know, Forgotten on Realms. On. It very much feels like a love note to D&D. Like, do you like yes. this campaign setting? Do you like this realm? Do you like yeah. this location? Did you want to ever interact with Morn Kanan or all these other characters, yes. these famous iconic D&D villains or monsters? This is like- They love showing us Strahd. Of, it's like, true. 50 years of D&D. And you know what? It's worth noting that um, not only do you get to interact uh, on a recurring basis with characters like Illustrial Silverhand um, and Morn and Kanan and Tasha, but there are other iconic characters who are go. present in the adventure. Drop some names. Uh, within the places and the Elminster, Driz, the pieces, come on. Um, are at and where the characters have to go to get the rod pieces out. Um, some There are some characters who are made allusion to, like Tiamat, as I okay. mentioned. She is most likely not going to appear on screen, but there are characters who very much do appear on screen. So that's probably Joe Manganiello's character. Uh... God, it starts with a T. I can't remember his name. I, or, or maybe it doesn't start with a T, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, product page says, Journey to six iconic D&D locations across the Forgotten Realms, including Planescape, Spelljammer, Eberron, Ravenloft, Dragonlance, and Greyhawk. Archon. Archon the Cruel is Joe Manganiello's Tiamat worshipping character. Uh, Archon might be the reference to Tiamat that we get. Um, and uh, I think that DMs will have a lot of fun portraying characters like Lord Soth, for example, who shows. All right, Lord Soth is present. Uh, Archon makes sense, because as far as I know, he's the last canonical holder of the Hand of Vecna. So that would make sense for Archon to be present. We know clearly Lord Soth and Strahd's going to be there. What's up? Um, Strahd shows up um, and is a pretty significant part of that bit of the adventure. And so I feel- Lolth, apparently, very clearly present here in this particular image. So Lord Soth, Strahd, probably Archon, clearly Lolth. I feel like anything that people are, are very much into uh, individually, there's probably gonna be something in this adventure for them. I hope so. You know, it feels like we're talking a lot about this adventure, but we are not actually spoiling stuff. Like, there are twists and turns. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, yes, there are major spoilers that we're not even yeah, yeah. touching. We're not even getting within a 10-foot pole's range of those things. I, I will completely honestly say this is one of my favorite adventures I've ever Oh, read. that's so that's so exciting. I'm really excited to hear that. Vecna just feels like the ultimate D&D &D villain. I think that's true, yeah. And I think one of the things that is really appealing about Vecna as a villain is that he's scary. Yeah. And the reason that he's scary is because he's he's undying, he, he's forever. Uh, he is a monolith. He's a monolith who, despite having been defeated in the past, continues to come back and continues to be this threat. And- I don't know if that was supposed to be Cass, right? With the sword, fighting Vecna. Even if the threat of Vecna is thwarted, 
there's always that sense that he's going to come back and that he's going to eventually threaten reality again. And now this most recent time is just, well, we thwarted him this time. The complete infinite thirst for power is what makes Vecna scary, like you said. You can also see he doesn't have his hand or his eye. So I'm assuming that at least the hand is still held by Archon. Said, you know, he he really it never has enough and wants to continue to become more powerful. And the more power that he gets and the more he becomes successful in his quest to subjugate others, uh, the more he wants. He's never satisfied and he's never going to stop until somebody stops him. And that's, I think, what makes him scary. As always, with all of our fifth edition books, these are all compatible with the 2020. I have to yes. say this books. part. So yeah. We have this amazing player's handbook coming out. Fantastic Monster Manual. I'm very excited for this new Dungeon Master's Guide. This all works together. Yes, that's 100% true. And I think you asked earlier, um, you know, uh, what was the inspiration? Why did we want to do this adventure? No, that was part of it, right? It was because the uh, the book is absolutely a love letter to D&D. It's a celebration of the 50-year history of D&D and some of these iconic characters, in some cases uh, older than some of our players, uh, older than the person who came up with the, the story of the book. Um, but it is also a very much a looking forward uh, and an evergreen type of adventure that will be available to players for, for many, many, many years to come. And, and we hope that uh, it really ties in and really emphasizes the fact that you know you can use these new books that are coming out and that's got to be cast right look at the sword uh, this adventure is still something that we hope will be exciting once you know well beyond that that time all right well i'm gonna be honest i'm kind of excited right i mean i I have a pretty even-keeled temperament when it comes to Watsy releases because I feel like they haven't really done a lot of... Uh, they haven't really wowed me with a lot of the stuff they've released. Um, I was a big fan of Tasha's Cauldron because it gave us so much new player stuff. I didn't really get a lot of... I wasn't really into too many of the things they released since then. I had a lot of hope for Fizzban's Treasury of Dragons. It did not meet my expectations. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I really wanted Fizzban's to be Draconomicon 2.0. And it wasn't. Um, I was really pumped about the Deck of Many Things. And I still do really appreciate that product. The Book of Many Things and everything associated with it. And I do still have to get back and give it its full kind of coverage. But it the delays around it like really kind of soured the whole experience for a lot of people given the delays and the product quality and then like Amazon still selling the busted product and the whole back and forth with that kind of really lessened the um, the appeal, if you will. So I have to say this is, you know, I'm, you know, the 2024 rule books are going to come out. I'm going to get them. We're going to talk about them. Uh, this adventure, the more I hear about it, that video really did a lot to kind of sell me on this adventure. It's got a lot of stuff. It also has a lot of potential to do a lot of things really well. It also has the potential to not, you know, which is hard to say, but um I want to give it a, I'm going to give it its fair shake. It's 2 months or so from now it'll come out. Uh maybe 3 months from now or so, we'll we'll check it out, see how we think about it. But um you know, uh, like I said, I didn't really love Bigby's Glory of the Giants. Planescape was kind of whatever. Spelljammer, we know, was kind of a flop, too. I like Fandelver and Below. That's why I'm running that game here on the on the channel, um, because I'm really enjoying it. Uh, but I also really love Lost Minds of Fandelver, and the first five chapters of Fandelver and Below are Lost Minds of Fandelver. So really, I'm just I'm not even that too familiar with what happens after the fact, so we'll have to see. Um Anyway, yeah, let me know your thoughts and opinions on Vecna Eve of Ruin. Are you excited about it like I am? Are you cautiously optimistic, which is probably the best way to go about these things? But it has the potential to bring in a lot of really cool characters from D&D 5e's history. Or, D I'm sorry, D&D's history, not just 5e. Uh, and I'm excited to see what happens. So, anyway, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. See you all next time.